Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to our talk. And I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I'd like to uh, introduce the UBC Mobility Group uh, briefly, because uh, that is the group that's um, sponsoring this talk. So um, addressing the mediums and meanings of mobilities and immobilities, our group aims to produce a new line of inquiry within mobility analysis at UBC. And that is a humanistic, interpretive, multilingual and culturally sensitive scholarship on multiple and intersecting mobilities. We will engage with the attention to mobility in cultural, historical, media and literary studies of the circulation of humans, objects, ideas, and images by drawing from both the humanities and the social sciences. The Mobilities Group is under the auspices of UBC Migration Center for Migration Studies. The UBC Center for Migration Studies seeks to understand the drivers and the consequences of international migration through research, education, and outreach. And uh, I would also like to thank the center's uh, team for arranging the technical logistics for this talk. I'd like to um, uh, briefly remind the attendees that the event, the talk itself is being recorded, but um, the Q&A section will not be recorded. And please, if you have uh, questions during the talk, uh, feel free to type your questions into the chat box and I will be monitoring. And at the end of the talk, obviously you can either um, turn up your audio and video to uh, have a conversation with our speaker today, or you can uh, type your questions into the chat box and I will be uh, reading them out loud and ask our speaker to respond to them. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dani Madrid Morales, who is a uh, lecturer at the Department of Journalism Studies at the University of Sheffield. Prior to this, he was an assistant professor at the Valenti School of Communication at the University of Houston and a Hong Kong PhD fellow at the City University of Hong Kong. Dr. Madrid Morales studies global political communication with a focus on the impact of new digital technologies in the production of state-sponsored news, global public opinion, and misinformation in the global South. He has published extensively on African-China mediated relationships particularly on the perception of Chinese media content in Kenya and South Africa. His latest work co-edited with Herman Wasserman is titled Disinformation in the Global South, uh, which is published by Wiley. Um, so uh, it is my, um, I'm very pleased to have uh, Dr. Um, Madrid Morales with us for a virtual talk. And the title of the talk is uh, on the screen, Afro-Chinese and Sino-African Media Flows in the Digital Space, a story of asymmetrical proportions. So welcome and uh, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Zhang, for uh, the introduction and for the invitation to uh, speak today. Um, the goal of uh, my talk today is to uh, do a couple of things. Um, the first one is to uh, introduce some ideas that I've been developing or uh, uh, putting together over the last 10 years, the time that I've been researching this specific topic of uh, uh, China, Africa, Africa, China uh, media exchanges. And then um, at the same time, I want to introduce some, uh, some new ideas, some, some new findings that uh, come from a couple ongoing projects that uh, I've started over the last year, year and a half, uh, one of which, for which I will present me, be presenting some data, uh, is uh, involves some um, some field work that I conducted at the end of last year uh, in Northwest and uh, and Southwest Kenya. Um, so, as as the title of my talk um, sort of implies, 
the, the main idea that I want to convey today here um, during my talk is that um, over the last few years, uh, there's been an increase in the amount of exchanges between China and Africa and Africa and China. And that uh, in that space, uh, one area that has uh, been substantial in the uh, increase in the amount of exchanges has been the media sector. Um, and the media sector, as you'll see in my talk, I see that in a very broad sense. I, uh, I see media as any form of, uh, of uh, information flow between the two uh, parts of the world. Um, and that can include books, magazines, uh, internet, blogs, memes, whatever you can think of. Um, and in this uh, space of increased uh, exchange between China and Africa, um, what I'll try to claim is that there's a very clear asymmetry in the flow. So a lot of the uh, uh, content flows from China towards Africa, but very limited uh, content flows from Africa to China. So I'll try to explain uh, what are the historical roots of, of this and what are the consequences of some of these imbalances that have been created uh, over the last um, few years. I've structured my talk uh, around uh, three, uh, you can call them case studies or examples. The first uh, one is how um, African media are covering the war in Ukraine via the content that they receive from Chinese media. The second case that I will be discussing is the arrival of entertainment from China into small villages uh, in Kenya. Uh, particularly, I'll talk about the case of uh, Kung Fu movies. And finally, I'll also discuss some uh, of the um, exchanges that happened during the uh, very first day, few days of uh, COVID-19 when a spat of, um, of racial discrimination against Africans in, uh, in Wangzhou led to uh, an increase in diplomatic tensions between the, the uh, peoples of Africa and China. Um, so with, with that, uh, let me start with uh, the very first uh, part of my talk, which is a bit of a preamble that I want to uh, use to set the stage for what we will be um, talking about today. I've, I've been asked to speak for about 35 minutes, so uh, I'll be short in the preamble so that I have more time to develop the three topics. Um, but uh, the starting point that I wanted for uh, today's talk is that, um, as many of you would probably uh, be familiar with, is that uh, when uh, China becomes a um, People's Republic uh, in 1949, at that point, propaganda and uh, more generally thought work were very instrumental in the uh, foundation of the Republic. And they were uh, a very key central argument in how uh, Mao Zedong understood the rise of communism in China. For, uh, for Mao, uh, at the time, propaganda uh, was a very important aspect uh, of the um, revolution. And that also implied uh, not only internal propaganda, but also external propaganda. For, for China, it was very important to communicate its message overseas. And, uh, and that was done in the case of Africa through uh, multiple means. For example, in the 1950s, 1960s, China began exporting magazines that were published in multiple languages. So uh, here are a couple of examples of, of these magazines that uh, China printed uh, and still prints. You can find these magazines today um, uh, online. Mostly they don't get printed anymore. Uh, one of them, uh, Pekan Information, which uh, is uh, the French version of uh, Beijing Review. That's what it's called today. It used to be called uh, Pekin Review. Um, and it was published in multiple different languages in the 50s and 60s. It only made its way into Africa in French and English. But later on, it was also translated into Swahili, which is a widely spoken uh, language in Eastern Africa. Uh, China Pictorial uh, was a magazine that was inspired by similar magazines in the Soviet Union that tried to convey in a very visual terms the uh, success and the progress that China was making um, throughout um, the revolution. So magazines were an important part. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, China also was very keen on developing a, a broadcasting sector so uh, from the early days in Yan'an, when the revolution was being uh, sort of uh, formalized, uh, China was uh, broadcasting uh, through a short wave and long wave, uh, particularly in English at the beginning. But then when it uh, tried to engage with African audiences, it began programming uh, in Arabic, in English and French, and then later on in Portuguese, Hausa and Swahili. So there was a, a wider range of languages in which uh, China was engaging with foreign audiences, and that was not something that was specific of China, that has to be said, right? At uh, the time, many um, uh, global powers were trying to uh, engage with foreign audiences uh, in uh, multiple languages. And the case of China is interesting because at no point in time was China uh, probably the uh, global power that had 
the largest amount of languages or the, la the, la the largest amount of hours that it was broadcasting in. Uh, but at the same time, it did have an impact in the um, um, Kenyan space. So here's a couple numbers, and I know that they're a bit small, but hopefully you can see them. And uh, if not, I'll draw your attention to uh, the second line here, which is the amount of hours that China was broadcasting uh, through the radio at the time. Uh, and uh, as you can see, China was always behind um, uh, the Soviet Union, for example, in total number of hours. It also uh, uh, was behind uh, Russia in the diversity of languages that it was broadcasting in. Um, and uh, it also lagged behind in how much audience it had. And I think that that's going to be an important point that I will be coming back later on today. So here on the right hand side, you have some data uh, from 1963 a survey that was conducted in uh, East Africa, trying to ask people what radio stations they would listen to. And uh, as you can see here, Radio uh, Pekin, that's what it was called at the time. Nowadays, it's called China Radio International, had a very small audience. Less than 9% of people would say that they would listen to that radio station compared to almost 40% or, uh, or for BBC or 25% uh, for BOA. So China had a presence in Africa. This historical presence is important to remember because uh, it sets the stage for what I'm going to be presenting in a little bit. Um, but also it's important to keep in mind that at that point in time, none of the radio stations that were broadcasting within the African space were able to do the same thing, which is reach across the ocean and get uh, to China. So uh, as you can see on the screen, there were a bunch of radio stations operating in Africa from um, Radio Tanganyika in Tanzania, uh, Radio Cairo, which was quite a large uh, network uh, operating at the time, or Radio Ghana, those were uh, widely spread and widely listened uh, within the African space, but none of them broadcast um, to China. On the one side, they didn't have the technology to reach uh, that far, but also uh, none of them had uh, the ability to broadcast in Chinese, which at the time was a requirement if you wanted to engage with, chi uh, with Chinese audiences. And why am I giving you all of these sort of uh, seemingly uh, unrelated uh, amount of information here is, uh, to demonstrate or to start setting the stage for what I think is an important um, uh, foundation of, of, of my talk today, which is that the asymmetries or the imbalances that I will be describing over the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes have a historical root. For a long, long time, China has been trying to engage with African audiences through the media. There's been a flow of content, ideas, and people in the media space from China to Africa, but no reverse uh, flow from Africa to China. And that's going to be important uh, for multiple reasons as I will be um, discussing later on. So with this, uh, uh, with this uh, historical context here, uh, I'll, I'll sort of fast forward to today that speaking about 1950s, 60s and 70s, as many of you probably know, 66 to 76, China went through the so-called cultural revolution, a period of time where uh, upheaval internally made it very difficult to engage with audiences overseas. A lot of these media stations or media uh, expressions uh, became all very marginal. Uh, for one reason, there was a shortage of paper, for example, that made it very difficult to print magazines and then export them overseas. There was also a, a shortcoming of technology uh, and spare parts to repair radio stations. So uh, for a while, it was difficult for China to survive in this space. So 1970s, 80s, and 90s, uh, China was not very active in this space. And then in the early 2000s, there was a boom again in the amount of expressions that, was, uh, um, that came along uh, Hu Jintao's plan of the so-called going out policy. The going out policy was a period of time uh, during which the Chinese leadership sort of, uh, urged companies in all sectors to become more global and media was not an exception. So that's the starting point of what I will be discussing today, this uh, expansion of media globally that reached Africa in the early 2000s and in some cases mid 2010s uh, and um, has set the foundations for the growth that has come um, in the last few years. With this historical context, let me move very briefly to more of the theoretical uh, context that I, that I will be using throughout uh, my talk today. And for these, I am going to call into the uh, wider literature on uh, global uh, communication and particularly on global media flows. Uh, I'm drawing on, on a bunch of, of literature and I am not sure how familiar you are with this literature, so I will not go into too much detail, but there's a little bit of uh, context that I want uh, us to uh, think about for a minute, which is this idea of 
the media space uh, being able to be divided into two sorts of uh, flows, what I will call dominant flows. And I here I follow some of the language uh, by an Indian scholar by the name of Dayathusu, who's proposed uh, some of these frameworks that I'm using here. So um, Dayathusu divides uh, media flows into two branches, dominant flows and contra flows. Dominant flows are those predominantly flowing from the north to the south, from uh, Western Europe and North America to the rest of the world. Contra flows are those that emerge as a counter power to uh, these dominant flows. And you can think of uh, TV stations like Al Jazeera, you can think of uh, Japanese animation, you can think of new forms of expressions in the media sector that appear as a counter uh, to the dominant North American European um, media. Within this space of, uh, of flows and contra flows, China obviously falls within the side of the contra flows. For many years, China has felt, and when I talk about China, I talk obviously about uh, uh, the way uh, the Chinese government sees itself. Uh, I cannot really represent the thoughts of every single Chinese person. Uh, and, and you'll excuse me when I, when I use the word China here, uh, it is to uh, describe the, the voice of the state more than uh, of, of regular Chinese individuals. Um, so in this, uh, in this sense, uh, China has seen itself as, uh, as needing to create a contra flow, a contra flow that goes in multiple directions and it covers both news, entertainment and, and, uh, and technology. So China is trying to create a contra flow that uh, counters balances um, uh, the dominant American flow. And that goes into three dimensions. On the one side, there's a flow of capital, which is actually very important. Chinese companies, and you might have heard Huawei, ZTE, uh, companies that are less well known, like Transion, are creating a new space where technology made in China made it, makes its way into Latin America, Southeast Asia. This technology uh, is cheap and it comes um, uh, with very welcome hands. Uh, by some countries, you can think of uh, the limit uh, budget that many African countries have. So when Huawei gets in with cheap technology, they're very happy to uh, accept it. So there's flows of capital, there's flows of content, which is going to be the predominant part of my talk today. And then with content also comes norms, norms and values, right? So certain content brings certain values and China is trying to export its own understanding of the world, its own understanding of society through uh, media content. I'll come back to these categories throughout my talk. So that's why I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on this. Let's leave aside now um, this preamble. And let me start with the first of the three uh, examples that I want um, to cover uh, today. And this first example has to do with narratives, how China tries to uh, dominate or uh, monopolize narratives around certain topics, particularly around current affairs. And for these, I'm gonna draw on examples from the recent invasion of Russia in Ukraine. Uh, this is, uh, as I said earlier on, an ongoing project that, um, that is trying to describe how uh, African digital media are being influenced by the content of foreign, um, large foreign powers. So uh, the evidence that we're presenting here comes from a large data set of news stories that we've been collecting over the last year and a half. But I'm just going to look at the last month and a half of, of less than a month, a month, uh, few weeks of uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I'll, and I'll focus on this one example. Uh, it might be um, something that you've never heard about, uh, but there's a magazine in, Ru in Uganda called The Independent. This magazine gets published every week. It's a magazine that focuses on global affairs, and it has a uh, small readership within um, the print uh, edition, but it also has a website that publishes regular content, uh, and you can go and visit uh, the independent.ug, that's the Ugandan um, domain. And this is a good example of what I would call um, a new breed or a new um, wave of online content that has developed in many African countries that's very small, somewhat independent uh, media organizations that produce websites with regular uh, updated news content. So the independent is a very small outlet with a uh, not too large following that has limited budget and therefore is unable to cover the world in the same way that a, a large established news organization would. So what the independent has been doing is relying on content that has been provided to them by a Chinese news agency called Xinhua. Xinhua is the uh, official news agency of the um, Chinese government. Uh, Xinhua has the status of a ministry so in a um, hierarchical structure of the uh, 
mm, Chinese state, Xinhua is at the same level as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Ministry of Education. Uh, that gives it that gives Xinhua a status of um, a clear mouthpiece of the uh, Chinese government. So Xinhua has engaged with the Independent as well as many other outlets in Africa, and it has provided free content um, to the organization. So what has happened is that uh, over the last month and a half, uh, the Independent has published 164 news stories about Ukraine. Of those, you can see an example here on the one side about uh, Lavrov, the foreign ministry of Russia, right? Of those 164 stories, 124 were provided word by word by Xinhua. So that means that about 75%, that's um, three quarters of the coverage that this news outlet uh, is doing of Ukraine is based on content produced by Chinese journalists that are given for free to the independent. Um, so this is a very small example, but it has some consequences on how those reading this newspaper or this, um, this website or this uh, magazine would understand the conflict in Ukraine. For this, I'm going to um, turn um, to a bit of a, a more um, gritty, nitty analysis of, of the content of this newspaper, right? So here you have a um, co-occurrence network uh, that is, if we look at all the words that appear in the uh, independent stories about Ukraine, and then we look at how often words occur with each other within each of the articles, we can draw a network where uh, the links between the words and the thickness of the line represents how often these words occur together. There's a lot of words here, but if you look carefully, you'll see that there's a very clear cluster on the right-hand side, which has to do with uh, finances, economics, and uh, probably the monetary consequences of war. You see words such as prices, high, supply, growth, percent, inflation. Um, and if you look carefully, what you will not see in this chart or in this uh, network are words about uh, death, crimes, refugees. None of that appears in this coverage. So if you look at how somebody who would get their information about Ukraine from this one specific magazine, you would see that their understanding, which is again, coming from Chinese news content, would not be about the human consequences of war, but the economical consequences of war. To see this difference more clearly, I'm going to show you another network from a completely different news station. That's one based in Kenya called Capital FM. And Capital FM, has relied significantly in their coverage of, of Ukraine on a French news agency called AFP, Agence France Press. So that's a non, um, a Western uh, news agency. Here, I'm going to draw your attention to another cluster of words. In this case, if you look at how um, Capital FM, and that is AFP, has covered the war in Ukraine, you'll see a lot more words that have to do with conflict, weapons, uh, refugees, humanitarian crisis, and so on. So both of these news organizations are covering the war via a foreign news agency. The Independent uses a Chinese news agency. Capital FM uses a uh, French news agency. And their view of the war is completely different, right? So when, one, when people ask me, for example, why do we care or why should we care about the fact that the Chinese news agencies are dominating the space in some African markets, well, this is a very clear evidence of how the framing of the war uh, is completely different from one from the other. Xinhua is providing this content for free. AFP is providing this content for a fee. So Capital FM is part of a larger uh, network and they can afford the cost of having content from a French agent, news agency, but the independent cannot afford this. And like the independent, many other news organizations uh, in Africa rely on this free content that's provided by China. Another example, so here you see um, the, the space in which Chinese narratives make their way into the African digital news space, but not only are um, African narratives making their way, we also see that through Chinese media, Russian narratives make their way into the content. So here's a trace of an article that starts in a Russian news agency called Interfax that gets translated into French by Xinhua and then gets published word by word into a small news outlet in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Content from Russia news agency goes into a Chinese news agency and then makes its own way uh, into an African country. This uh, 
step is permitted obviously by the close ties between China and Russia and how China has uh, decided that it engages in the promotion of, of some of Russian narratives. Uh, but here again, the flow is unidirectional, right? So we do not see a reverse flow through which African narratives make their way back into uh, Chinese spaces. There are some African narratives, and I, I think that it's important for us to, uh, let me skip this for a second. Um, it's important for us to keep in mind that there's some African narratives that do make their way onto uh, the Chinese media space, but those narratives only occur within the context of Chinese platforms. For example, um, there's a lot of Chinese um, uh, workshops organized for African journalists, where African journalists are brought into China or at least they were brought into China before COVID-19 to learn um, the trade of journalism. For many of them, then they were given a, a space or a platform to publish their own articles. So this one, for example, is published by an by a African journalist in one of uh, China's uh, state-owned uh, newspapers, uh, People's Daily. So in this case, an African journalist is able to retell their own version of an event, their visit to China, but only within the space of a uh, sponsored space by a uh, Chinese media organization. So there's no free space where uh, uh, African journalists would be able to express themselves. Another example um, that I'm showing you here is from CCTV Plus. CCTV Plus is, is one uh, news agency specialized in video content where African, African experts are often given voice uh, to express their views on global affairs. But again, this is not the case of an uh, African news agency going into China, creating its own uh, headquarters and its own space. It is using the platforms that China offers um, to try to make a space uh, for their voice to be heard. So in this first example, what I wanted to uh, convey is this idea that in a, a global exchange of news, where uh, news flows from one country to the other, China has been able to, to, to um, sort of uh, carve a space within the African digital space to distribute its own content that many news organizations because of the political economy of the media are very willing to accept that content, but that there's no reverse flow. There's no mobile mobility towards uh, uh, China in any um, way. Let me move to the second example, which uh, is slightly different. Instead of looking at news content, now let me look at um, entertainment. And in this case, I will uh, focus on one specific um, example of how content um, in the entertainment space flows uh, back to um, from China back to, uh, back to Africa. And again, this is based on some of the uh, fieldwork that I conducted uh, late last year, uh, where I uh, decided to visit some rural spaces um, in Northwest and Southwest Kenya to see how people were engaging with Chinese content that comes to them through satellite dishes. What you see back there in this image, this orange satellite dish, uh, I'll show you a, a close up in a minute, uh, is a satellite dish that's set up by a Chinese company called Star Times. Star Times is probably one of the least well-known uh, global Chinese media companies. Star Times is a uh, TV provider that offers pay TV content uh, to African audiences and only African audiences, startups only operates in the Afri on the African continent. Uh, but it's a company that's a privately owned, um, even though it has very close, uh, co close context to, um, to China. Um, startups offers what one would call a um, whole vertical uh, integration of the uh, uh, news content and distribution system. So startups provides the technology, it sets up the satellite dish, Star Times provides the decoders needed to be able to watch that content. And Star Times provides the actual content that people see on their TVs. So Star Times dominates the whole market from production to distribution uh, to reception. Um, obviously, Star Times competes in a very crowded space. There's other companies operating in the same space. Uh, there's a South African company called DSTV that also has a wide presence. There's a French company called Canal Plus that dominates the French speaking market. So, but within this space, startups is probably the one that has the widest spread uh, across the continent. Now, um, during uh, my field work, one of the things that I was very interested in understanding is when these installations come into a village, 
when a family decides that they want to set up one of these satellite dishes to uh, watch content, what is it that they decide to watch? Uh, and for this, I, I talk to people and I'm gonna focus on, on one family, um, mother, son, and the neighbor. Husband wasn't at home when I was uh, interviewing them. So I'm gonna talk about the neighbor that was also quite willing to share what was the kind of content that they love watching on, on, on these uh, satellite dishes that provide Chinese content alongside content from other parts of the world. I, may, I, must, I must insist on that, that when somebody buys one of these satellite dishes, it's not that they only buy content from China, they buy content from all over the world. But one specific characteristic of Star Times is that they also include content from China, which is not available in other platforms. So say if I was to subscribe to a South African provider, I wouldn't be able to access some of the content that these families are able to access. So when I asked um, the mother of this family, what was her favorite channel on, on Star Times, she would call, she would say, well, my favorite channel is called uh, Esti Swahili. Esti Swahili is a, a platform where um, this Chinese company called Star Times dubs content into Swahili language, particularly soap operas, um, either regional or uh, Chinese. When I asked the kid what was uh, his favorite channel, he said that his favorite channel was National Geographic. Now, when I asked the father, he said his favorite channel is called Kung Fu. Kung Fu is a uh, channel that specializes exclusively on uh, martial arts movies that come from China. And, um, and what's interesting here is that there's a very long history on how when China has tried to engage uh, with uh, African audiences to entertainment, they have done that oftentimes uh, through Kung Fu. Now, what all of these have in common, except for National Geographic, which is obviously a, a US-based channel, is that the narratives that come or the representations of China that come through these channels are very specific. None of the content that, will, that people will watch on here will be at all critical about China. It will be presenting a very specific image of China that um, is not controversial, that shows a very modern and advanced China. It uh, creates a certain representation of China that um, Africans uh, might, who might not be able to travel to China will perceive as the authentic content while um, if they were able or they were willing to access more critical content, they might be perceiving a slightly different uh, version of, of, of China. So on the one side, these platforms provide uh, Chinese content where it's Uxia movies, right? So martial arts movies or um, content that's more uh, about contemporary China, what uh, one would call uh, Chinese dramas, TV dramas. Those are oftentimes dubbed into local, local languages. So one could watch uh, some of these shows in, in Hausa or in Swahili. Uh, they also have some dubbing into uh, French with uh, Senegalese uh, voice actors, for example. But also there's quite a bit of content that is made specifically for African audiences. Some of it produced by Star Times uh, on its own, some of it bought to local uh, providers. So there's these multiple layers of content, all of which, however, flow in one single direction. I, I know that I will be repeating myself over and over again with this idea, but at this point, what I think it's important to remember is that we have a Chinese company that sees a market opportunity, develops a wide satellite dish market, and in that space, it is able to export content from one part of the world to the other, from China to Africa, but there's no similar opportunity on the other way around. If an uh, African company like DSTV, again, a South African company with a very wide reach across the continent, wanted to try to do the same thing in China, open its own satellite dish platform, you would find that that's not possible because the uh, uh, legal framework in China does not allow a foreign company to distribute content uh, within the Chinese space. So again, another form of imbalance, in this case, it's a regulatory or a legal imbalance where uh, the framework, the legal framework within uh, most African countries is very open to foreign investment in the media sector, while in China, that same legal framework is very closed and limited. We can look at this in a more uh, numerical way. And I know there's a lot of numbers here, but I'll, I'll try to explain why this chart matters. And I'm gonna draw your attention to the first two lines uh, of the chart. These are official statistics from uh, the China Statistical Yearbook, and it shows the number of hours of TV content that goes from China to Africa and the number of hours that go from Africa to China. So in the last 10 years, if you look at the number of hours of content from Africa that has made its way into Chinese TV stations, you'll see that in 2008, it was zero hours, zero hours in 2009, three hours in 2010, 
And at the highest point in 2015, it was 49 hours. Overall, over the last four years, not a single uh, case of African TV content has been exported to China. At the same time, China has been able to export over 1,000 hours in several years from China to Africa. Now, if you compare this to a couple other examples, very randomly chosen, for example, South Korea, you'll see that South Korea exports to China a thousand times more content than Africans are able to do. And Africa, obviously, it's a whole continent with 54 countries and one of the largest media production markets in Nigeria with Nollywood. So even though Nigeria is a space with such a wide range of content, none of it flows back from Africa to China. And this is specifically or critically important to understand, right? Because when Chinese uh, leaders try to explain why it is so important for companies in the media sector to be able to be present in Africa, they use this narrative of, well, this is a friendship of mutual partners, a win-win situation, a mutual cooperation, uh, an exchange agreement. But in that narrative, the survey, uh, a void behind it, which shows that while content flows from one side to the other, it doesn't flow back. Now, let me move to the last example um, that I had for you today, which has to do with the digital space. Um, and in this case, I will look at uh, a series of uh, racist episodes that happened in the city of Wangzhou. Wangzhou is located in Southern China. It is probably the epicenter of the African diaspora in China. There's a lot of uh, Africans that go to Wangzhou. Some of them go to study, uh, while others go to uh, Wangzhou uh, as traders. They seek to uh, buy uh, merchandise and then they can uh, ship back into Africa and sell uh, in local markets and, and, and stores and, and whatnot. So one Joe was an epicenter during the early days of COVID-19 of, uh, of a series of, uh, of racist uh, incidents. It first started with several African students uh, posting on social media that had been evicted from the hotels where they were staying. Then there was uh, some claims on, on a TV station like this one, NTV, uh, where uh, some Africans were explaining how they were being chased by the police out of their hotels. There was also a very uh, obviously unfortunate incident where a McDonald's in Guangzhou posted a sign saying that Black people were not welcome inside the restaurant. Um, and soon enough, all of these uh, series of incidents were picked up by uh, international media, Al Jazeera, uh, BBC, CNN, uh, South China Morning Post, they were running stories about all of these incidents in which Africans were being discriminated against. Again, I insist at the very early days of the COVID-19 when China was still figuring out what was the best way to proceed. Um, so this soon became a political issue with uh, several Chinese ambassadors being asked um, to uh, meet with local uh, African leaders to explain what was being done for this, there's a very uh, widely circulated video, the one here on the right hand side uh, in Nigeria, where the uh, um, uh, Speaker of the Parliament in Nigeria sort of like scolds very clearly the ambassador in Nigeria, asked for clear explanations on what was happening and why, that, why was that happening. So, what started as a series of, uh, of protests or of uh, complaints that uh, African students had on social media that were amplified by global uh, news networks, and then eventually made their way back onto social media where uh, African politicians saw this as an opportunity uh, to ask for um, explanations or uh, justifications from um, Chinese ambassadors and so on, uh, was seen as a sort of a crisis situation for um, Chinese media that soon enough started a process of counter narrative uh, in which they wanted to control how these um, crisis uh, was unfolding, and they used a series of strategies that are very significant of how China has engaged with any type of crisis that threatens to uh, damage its image overseas. Um, so the first thing that happened was that China tried to uh, flood the space with positive information about how well uh, Africans are being treated in China. Uh, here are a couple of examples from CGTN. CGTN is uh, a uh, branch of CCTV, which is the national broadcaster in China. And if you go through their website now, uh, there's less of these stories, but uh, for a period of time, there were regular stories in which 
Um, the idea was to convey, uh, or the idea to convey was that Chinese did not discriminate against Africans in any way. Then this was turned into a, a barrage of tweets by ambassadors and ministers that were showing life for Africans in China is perfectly normal. And when none of these strategies seemed to calm things down, then the third strategy was to start claiming that all of this was uh, incidents of, of uh, disinformation and misinformation. And the truth is that some of the videos that were circulated at the time were not accurate, but um, then this became a matter of, well, this is an orchestrated campaign against China. None of what's being said is true. And what these three examples here show you is the strategies that uh, many uh, in, in, within the Chinese media space are using whenever a crisis breaks out, which is let's inundate the space with positive information. If that doesn't work, then let's discredit some of those that are making the claims. And by engaging in this counter narrative and using digital technology to engage in this counter narrative, they end up echoing or like quieting the voices that were critical in the first place. So what this third example shows you is that even when digital technology has enabled, um, in this case, students and, and migrants to use this technology to uh, voice their concern because they were being discriminated against, the same technology is being instrumentalized and being used, being uh, um, used by, by, by Chinese uh, media and Chinese authorities and Chinese ambassadors to counter the narrative. And because of the uh, obviously larger uh, manpower that uh, Chinese media have, they inundate or flood the space with uh, counter narratives that then quiet um, the original complaint. So, I've gone through three examples and I've given you some uh, historical overview. Let me conclude here as I'm getting close to uh, the time uh, with a few final thoughts. The first one is in this sort of unilateral, uni, uh, one way flow of uh, information and entertainment from China to Africa, um, there's five areas in which China is excelling or uh, actually being able to uh, take advantage of, of its uh, dominant power, right? So. Uh, and some of these I've already explained them here. The first one is that China is able to use its capital flow um, to develop infrastructure. And then this infrastructure is used to inundate in, in certain way, the uh, media space with uh, content and with ideas. And the first example here, or the best example is a project that was uh, led by Star Time, this company that I showed you earlier on that is in the uh, pay TV market to provide access to TV to 10,000 villages in Africa. So this is a, is a situation where villagers that do not have access to TV are given the technology, Chinese technology, and also given the Chinese content alongside other type of content. And this is possible because China has this uh, infrastructural power that local players do not have. China is also using training um, as a way to have its values and norms flow uh, into the African space. It's using uh, its content production power, production power to create content in multiple languages and distribute it locally. Um, this distribution happens in both the entertainment and the news sector. And then obviously there's also in uh, situations of direct investment where Chinese companies uh, buy African companies. I haven't talked about this and I will uh, not really go into this example, but um, that also is happening. And obviously as the last example that I show you here, um, China has also now mastered the use of social media in, in a way that it can um, do some crisis management whenever a crisis happens, and that this creates uh, a new form of imbalance where, because of the uh, massive size of uh, those operating uh, Chinese influence operations on, on social media, can quiet the voices that are critical. So um, to final, finalize my, my, my chat here, I want to leave you with the three main um, imbalances or asymmetries that are uh, I see uh, happening today that are affecting this flow that is supposed to be bidirectional, but in the end, it's mostly unidirectional. There's on the one side, an asymmetry in the amount of flows of content, capital and norms. Um, and that is a lot of the content that gets produced in China makes its way onto the African market because China has the infrastructure to distribute that content, but there's no reciprocity that allows same content or content that might be interesting for African, for Chinese audiences to flow back onto Africa, onto China. There's been criticism by some uh, uh, African leaders 
Nigerians, for example, have been asking for a long time for China to be more open to the uh, importing of Nollywood movies, but that hasn't been happening. And China has also not done much to try to, um, the Chinese authorities have not done much to create a market that is receptive to this type of, co type of content. Second important asymmetry has to do with the re regulatory frameworks. Uh, well, uh, most African countries are very open uh, to the arrival of foreign companies in the media space. Uh, China is very close to this sector. There's no uh, opportunity for a company, a large company like DSTV, a South African company, to try to do the same thing that Star Times is doing um, in Africa, in China. And obviously, there's an asymmetry in, in the agency that's being exercised by, by actors in both spaces. Um, for example, there's large numbers of Chinese journalists operating in Africa. A lot of correspondents are based in Africa. that are able to tell their stories, whether in local languages or in Chinese. But there's no similar possibility for most African uh, journalists to travel to China with the freedom that uh, their counterparts enjoy. So with these levels of asymmetry, what uh, one who reads Chinese media might think is a, a mutual flow of ideas and content in a one-way flow where uh, things flow one side to the other, but they do not flow back onto um, the uh, Chinese market. And with this, I'll stop um, talking and uh, see if there's um, any thoughts or reflections.